I was just talking to somebody uh, over lunch today. I said, we, we teach math, science, all these things in, in college, but nobody focuses on honesty and integrity. And today we are actually breaking it right in the households, right? So think about a simple example. How many times parents don't send their kid to school and they say, yeah, I'll just send an email to the teacher saying you were sick. Well, that's where it really starts breaking, right? That kid is growing up saying, it's okay for me to say I was sick when I was not really sick. I was really just watching TV all day, but I was bored. And then you pull the hooky. I mean, what are you teaching to those little kids? Right? That little kid is not going to grow up and, and, and admit that, hey, I don't know something. I don't know this. And why? that's why you're seeing this happen through colleges where people are creating fake resumes, they're building their profiles. Oh, I can do this, I can do that. Oh, I know this person, I know that person. When the reality is they don't know them. And what we have forgotten is it's okay to not know something. It is okay to say no to something. Welcome to Grow Think Tank. This is the one and only place where you will get insight from the founders and the CEOs of the fastest growing privately held companies. I am the host. My name is Gene Hammett. I help leaders and their teams navigate the defining moments of their growth. Are you ready to grow? Today we talk about integrity. Maybe an odd conversation to talk about because shouldn't we all have a high level of integrity? Well, creating a culture of integrity takes a lot of uh, intention and thought. And you're going to make sure that you are creating the right space for people to be honest with you. Our special guest today is the founder of Data Sears. They were on the Inc. Uh, 5000 list this year, but we talk with Adweight uh, Joshi about just really what does it take to create that culture of integrity? What is really included into it? What gets in the way of integrity? The hint is it starts at home. And I have been guilty of this, uh, but we want to make sure we look at it ourselves because we want to make sure we're holding ourselves to the highest integrity possible. I really try to live by that. I don't try to uh, skirt the situation at all in any ways, but I want to make sure that we have this conversation because I think it's necessary. A culture of integrity will give you a higher satisfaction rate inside your workforce, and it will also help you with your bottom line. So make sure you stay tuned to this interview with Adway. When I think about my journey as a leader, I had some help along the way. I had uh, a CEO coach 20 something years ago. Her name was Linda. Linda gave me some insights. Linda gave me something to, you know, to think about that was different than my current challenges. And she asked me powerful questions that allowed me to navigate through some big issues that were going on in my company. And I thank her for it today. Now, who is your Linda? Who is the person who guides you and gives you a place to talk to? Well, if you don't have an executive coach, I'd love to chat with you about what's going on in your business give you some insights around this. Absolutely no cost to you. Promise not to make an offer, but I want to build a relationship. I'm looking for partners. I work with a lot of companies hands-on. I work with a lot of different people inside their organizations. And if you're curious around what coaching could do or leadership development, then make sure you reach out to me, genehammett.com. Uh, you can schedule a call. We can talk about you know the business, the culture, the leadership, the gaps, um, the strategy, whatever it is you want to talk about. If you think there's a, a something missing and you're not, you need someone to talk through these issues, reach out. I'd love to hear from you. Just go to genehammett.com and schedule your call today. Now here's the interview with Adway. Adway, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Gene? I'm fantastic. Excited to talk to you today about your culture and, and what's made Data Sears the company that it is today. Before we go any further, tell us about Data Sears. So Data Sears is a fintech. Uh, we have a few different modules. One of our most popular ones classifies as a rec tech, which is a technology meant for the regulatory landscape, which is anti-money laundering, financial crimes compliance, fraud, uh, and scams, and all of that. And then the other side, we actually do a lot of things with payment reconciliation. So I always tell this uh, to people, right? Every time you go and spend your money on a card and you get your statement, how do you know that amount is right? How did you know that you're not overcharged or undercharged? We don't go back and look at every single transaction and, and try to add it up. It will be impossible. So multiply that by 100 million, 200 million customers that some of these banks have. It just becomes a very daunting task. So we automate all of that. What do you think this whole fintech world is moving to over the next five years? It's interesting. Uh, it's interesting because first we'll have to separate out the noise from the, the real meat here, right? Because today, if you say fintech, uh, somebody writes you a big check, that idea can be anything. It, it may not have to be viable. Um, you literally start a new company, create a lot of noise, spend money. People are doing parties everywhere at all these conferences. Uh, if you saw Bitcoin Miami, 
it was just money flowing through everywhere, right? I mean, you just saw this and was like, wow, what's going on? So as the economy turns down and uh, reality comes back out, we are going to find that uh, people who are really doing what makes a difference, whether it is cultural, social, economic, they are the ones who are going to survive. Uh, and some of these fintechs are going to have to really learn how to make money because they are running on, you know, all this hyper fuel, which is fueled by VCs. But what happens when you run out of that fuel? How do you continue to climb? And that's uh, what's going to happen in the next few years, at least in the next one year, we are going to see. And we're already starting to see some of the dominoes fall. So we'll see how deep this goes. Well, I appreciate that little insight around the industry you're in. But we're going to focus most of our conversation today on the people, the culture of your company. When we were doing some research about your company, you made the ink list um, number 1503 this year. It's a 400% growth rate. We don't have to get into the details, but what, do you, what part of your culture do you attribute the growth of your company to? So one of the things we have always been open is about diversity and inclusion. And let's just see what that means to us, right? Uh, I was in a conference not too long ago, and an amazing person uh, said this, that you know everybody is diverse. Even two brothers growing up in the same family are diverse because they have different way of thinking. So we look at diversity the same way. We look at what do you bring to the table that we don't already have, right? And everybody has something. Every single person has something that somebody else doesn't. And so we focus on that. And luckily for us, what, has, what that has translated out into is different cultural, social, and economic backgrounds. Uh, people in our in our company have come from Latin America, Brazil, like Brazil, uh, Dominican Republic. Uh, we have people like Bobby who is from Bulgaria. We have people from Turkey. We have people from Burkina Faso. We have people from Cameroon, India, Korea. You know, and all these countries that people have migrated here for a better life, of course, because we are the land of opportunity. And we just found out that when we put our international culture forward and we call ourselves a culture first company, we end up attracting all these different people. So that's kind of become an interesting thing, right? HR always asks the question for fun, like, hey, what other language do you speak, right? You know, those are like cookie points. Uh, obviously, you're not going to tell somebody that, hey, just because you speak English, you're not going to hire you. We want you. But if you do something else that adds to our culture and the languages that we speak, uh, you know, and all of that, so it, it creates a fun environment. Because let's be realistic, right? Today, we are living in that environment. No matter where we go, we see a massive uh, cultural difference. We, have see, we see all people coming from all different communities, all different countries, and coming together and mingling. So that's where we created this culture at work. So it doesn't have to feel like work. It just feels like, hey, I'm just going to go see a bunch of friends. Adwai, you were talking a lot about diversity, and I appreciate that because that's a really good understanding of how you approach your company with, with examples. But inclusion is something that I think a lot of people don't get. How do you define or explain inclusion? So for us, again, uh, we have to make sure that opportunities are created for uh, folks that have been typically left behind, right? You have to focus on things where you have to make sure that everything that you do, design, and everything that you uh, put out there is equally accessible. So my master's thesis, right, was around how do you design uh, environment so that folks who have cerebral palsy who are in wheelchair are able to access, right? That's inclusion. Like you, you cannot build a, you know, you don't want to put sugar on the topmost shelf, right? If you think about it, like why is sugar not on the topmost shelf in a grocery store? Because people who don't have the grip strength and the reach capabilities, they don't want them to grab that thing and it falls on your head, right? So you've got to think about those outliers who you want to make sure that they are given the opportunity. So we are all inclusive. We don't care about, you know, what your gender is. We don't care what your orientation is. We don't care about any of that. And so we make an environment that is inclusive of all of those. And that way, nobody feels like they're left behind. So diversity, we seek and inclusion, we create. So people feel that they're a part of this community. Nobody's left out. Like we want to see, what do you bring? Let's highlight that. You have something, you know, whether it's ideas, whether it's a approach, whether it's whatever, you know, we are not good. You don't have to feel left out in any way, shape or form in what we do. Well, that takes us right into the next part of this, which is really talking about the culture of honesty and integrity. Those are big words that a lot of people think they understand. How do you use them as it relates to the culture of the company? Yeah. So uh, in fact, I was just talking to somebody uh, over lunch today. I said, we, we teach math, science, all these things in, in college, but nobody focuses on honesty and integrity. And today we are actually breaking it right in the households, right? So think about a simple example. How many times parents 
don't send their kid to school and they say, yeah, I'll just send an email to the teacher saying you were sick. Well, that's where it really starts breaking, right? That kid is growing up saying, it's okay for me to say I was sick when I was not really sick. I was really just watching TV all day, but I was bored. And then you pull the hooky. I mean, what are you teaching to those little kids? Right? That little kid is not going to grow up and, and, and admit that, hey, I don't know something. I don't know this. And why? that's why you're seeing this happen through colleges where people are creating fake resumes, they're building their profiles. Oh, I can do this. I can do that. Oh, I know this person. I know that person. When the reality is they don't know them. And what we have forgotten is it's okay to not know something. It is okay to say no to something, right? We, we don't expect, like when we interview people, I don't expect you have all the answers. It's, it's the opposite. If, if somebody says, I don't know the answer to this question, but I swear as soon as we hang up, I'm going to go look what the answer is because it's going to bother me uh, for the rest of the day. That's who I want versus somebody is trying to come up with these answers and, and I'm sitting here and saying, okay, you, you clearly don't know. It's okay to say you don't know, but don't, you know, the, the more you try to dig your hole, it's, it's getting deeper, right? So that, that's the key here is we want people to be honest. You know, come to me at nine o'clock in, in the morning to work and say, hey, I don't feel like I'm going to be 100% efficient today. Is it okay if I go home? I'll come back another time. I'll still finish my work another time. But right now, my mind's not in the right place. And I just don't think I can do justice for what you want me to do. And that's okay to say today, right? We don't want you to say, well, I'm sick. When you're not really sick, but you don't want to go to work because, you know, there is a lot weighing on your shoulder, right? It's, it's sometimes it's okay. I mean, we have all these scenarios. We're all humans. We're all going to have ups and downs and we're going to have a better day. I mean, I, I gave an example. I said, Tiger shows up on a golf course. Everybody wants him to win, but someday he plays. I bet people say, well, you know what? I can play better than him. But and his Tiger is the best golfer in the world. And then some days he comes back after an accident. They're like, ah, he's not going to win. And he ends up winning the Masters, right? And you're like, what the heck? You know, so, so that's literally how life is. Someday you're going to be at your top. Someday you're not going to be. Let's acknowledge it. I mean, not two days are similar. So honesty and integrity starts with admitting these things. It's okay. That's not a problem. I mean, so build a culture where you could walk in, you could literally say, hey, I'm taking a mental break. You know, I did that this week. I said, Thursday, I'm going to take a day off. Hey, anything going on? No, I'm just tired. I'm going to take, I'm going to sleep, you know, I'm just going to refresh so that I can come back more, you know, recharged. And, and that's what I mean by honesty and integrity that don't try to work around, don't try to beat around the bush, just address the thing head on. And when you do that, what you will find is everybody's happy because once you tell a lie, then you've got to tell more lies to cover that one lie. And it just becomes never ending. So Edward's been talking about integrity and I want to, to mention something. I, I feel like there's a lot of people that are not completely in integrity with their word. And if you expect others in your organization to be honest with you and have integrity, you want to make sure you lead by example. When you say you're going to do something, you do it. When you say you're going to be there on time, you're there on time. When you say you're going to be prepared, you're prepared because you want to make sure that you are leading by example. This is something that's very important in leadership. There's a lot of people that say, do as I say, not as I do. That just doesn't fly for me. I share this with you because I want you to reflect on this for a second. How aligned are you with your integrity and your word? Back to Joe Hadway. I agree with you. The, the whole lies association, the, you know, the white lies versus regular ones, it's just that slippery slope. And inside of a work organization, I feel like we need to be really transparent with each other and have these kind of conversations. And I think it probably scale, scares the heck out of CEOs to say that someone's going to come in and say, I need a mental health day. I personally believe the best thing that they can do is have the enough trust and, and safety in what they're doing to say, I need a mental health day. I understand my work. I understand the deadlines. I'm on top of it, but I just need a day to, to process or data to unplug. I'd rather them tell me that up front. And that's what you're experiencing. You have people that are coming in doing this. Is, what impact does that make on the bottom line? Uh, it, it doesn't because, you know, we always, as a business people, we always build redundancies in, right? So we, so we have an unlimited sick policy, for example, which means that if an employee is sick, they don't get limited up number of days. That's like saying, well, I only want you to be sick 10 days in a year, man. You can't be sick more than 10 days a year. Well, it doesn't work like that, right? You're sick, you're sick. Just stay home and, and, and take focus on yourself. So we have to plug it in. And that, that's a math, right? Everybody has an efficiency. So I, I break it down saying if there is 40 hours in a week where people are expected to work and they're spending 45 hours because one hour every day is lunch break, 
there's no way in hell that they're going to be efficient for 40 hours, right? It's impossible. <laughs> you know, you're coming in the morning, you know, you have energy, then mid afternoon, your energy level drop, you take a break, you drink some coffee, you get back up, you eat. One o'clock is not the same as nine o'clock in the morning. And that also changes people by people by people, right? I have seen that I can stay very fresh from nine to four. Uh, and then I take a dip at around four. So I might just take a walk and then 30 minutes later, I'm back and I can go for another four hours if I want to. So that changes from person to person to person. But if you build in the fact that this is like, we are not a law firm, right? I don't need 2000 billable hours from individuals in a given day, given year. Otherwise I'm not going to make money, right? We are a software company. So we are task oriented. So if you finish the task in two hours, power to you, go take a break. You know, if you take eight hours to finish your task because you you made mistakes, you know, five times, then either A, take a break so you don't make those many mistakes or take a break and finish the task the ninth time or tenth time, whatever, right? So we we it doesn't really affect us because we have that built in to our culture and built in within our uh, system. So yes, you know, in meeting deadlines is important. And on the flip side, right, clients want you to deliver A, B, and C. So we do often see uh, you know, there is a, there's an imbalance, right? So there are a couple of folks in the company typically ends up being the most important people in the company always find themselves working 24, 7, 365. You call me at three o'clock in the morning, I'm jumping out of my bed and saying, what can I do for you? Right. And so there is that imbalance, which is why, uh, you know, adding more middle management, taking charge and communication is important. You, you know, you know, you're not going to meet the deadline, but you don't know it five minutes before, you know, you knew it a few days in advance, right? So communicate, let, you know, Hey, I don't think I can do this, right? And sometimes people don't want to hear it. I mean, I go into calls and I tell clients all the time, clients want to implement their solution yesterday. Every single client that comes to us, they want to go live yesterday. And I keep telling them, guys, best possible scenario is 90 days. Worst possible scenario is six months. That's how long it's going to take. They don't want to hear it. They want to hear, yes, I can do this in one week, but I can't. You know, yeah. I will be putting false expectations I will be telling them that go do this and then they won't and they will, they will get upset. So I can do this properly if, if everybody, and it's a matter of convincing. It's a matter of saying that, listen, it's just not, it's impossible. You, what you're asking for is unrealistic. I was talking about balance at work and a lot of different scenarios were talked about, but I wanted to just mention something and put a spotlight on. You want to make sure that you are giving people the balance they need at work, that mental health issues are real deal today. I've talked to a lot of CEOs that are like curious about how do we deal with this? We've never had so many people come in and say, I just need some space or I need uh, a few days off. Give them what you can. I'm not saying that you're going to you know, give someone a month off when they're you know, feeling down, but you're going to make sure that you are the kind of leader that gives space and understands space. And you should take space too. You should lead by example, as I mentioned earlier. You want to make sure that, that you are creating a place where people to come to you and say, I need a few days, I need one day, I need the afternoon off and be able to have the kind of conversation that gives them that space, but also the kind of conversation that says, look, I, I'm happy to give you that space. Just want to make sure you keep up with the work that you're, you're committed to. And if you ever get behind or you need support, let us know, we'll, we'll work out something because that really is kind of a caring leadership that's really prevalent in today's world. And if you're not sure about this, your younger audience, those Gen Ys, Gen Zs, they're going to be craving it. They're going to be re requiring it to have that kind of balance inside of work. So just think about that, being able to give a little bit of space where needed. Back to our interview. How do you set expectations with employees in the first? And I know we should hire honest people that have integrity, but how are you setting expectations around the culture and the way this works so that people understand what you expect of them? Great question. So we have a philosophy and we just implemented a tool for doing this is we focus on learning development, right? So I tell people that typically folks go to college, you know, if you go to Harvard, you're spending $100,000, $150,000 a year in education fees, taking student loans, you know, you're paying to go to college to learn. In our establishment, we are paying you to learn and we are giving you industry experts. I'll give you an example. 
I'm on the board of a local school here and, and they want me to go teach in the school because they're like, we don't have the expertise. They had a 16 year old kid create some, you know, cybersecurity program. And the professor was like, I have no idea. The teacher was high school teacher. Like, we have no idea what he has done, right? We don't have the expertise, not in just my school, but we don't have it in any other schools because we send it out and people are like, we have no idea. We have to train first. So, you know, when, when they ask us, CEOs of companies who are working in this industry to go and teach these little kids and mentor these little kids. I look at our staff and say, you guys are lucky we are right here. You know, we have expertise in the company who there are people who are great at doing certain things and we'll teach you. And guess what? We'll actually pay you. So it's almost like staying in a permanent internship where you're getting paid salary of a job and you're constantly learning. At that point, you start seeing that people care. People look at it and say, wait, Yes, I'm doing something. Yes, I'm coding for you. I'm, I'm, I'm make, you know, making you more money than I'm making. But I'm getting something out of it. I'm getting satisfaction in what I have done. I'm, I'm growing in my career. I am creating this environment of, wow, you know what? I can be the next guy now. So when new guys come in, I become their mentor, right? So if you create that leadership a tree, if you may, uh, people like it. And, and everybody's different. So I learn from all of the people that I work with every single day. And I tell them, it's not just me telling you what to do. You need to tell me what to do. You know, you have to teach me because you have skills that I don't have. You know, I went to school 22 years ago. Now schools are very different. They teach different things, right? Which again, I, there's, a, there's a great friend of mine here who is a CTO of a very large multi-billion dollar organization. And he went to Georgia Tech to do cybersecurity. And he was saying, you know, some days I get scared. These young kids who are with me, who are like age of my kids, are literally amazing. And I look at them and say, like, wow, I mean, I'm, I'm legitimately scared of these people, right? So it's a different culture. We, are, we have all these youngsters who are smart. So adopt it. It's not about, just, it's not a one-way street. It's a two-way street. So create an opportunity where, you know, we have a flat organization, open door policy, come on in, talk to us, work with us, tell us what can we do for you. And that helps a lot in creating loyalty. And again, it doesn't work for everybody. Because, you know, we all know what's going on right now, the great resignation, quiet quitting. I mean, there's many words that are going on, but there is always going to be that. It always has existed. Uh, it has never, you know, it's not like now it's at the highest and then a few years ago it was not. It's always there. It's always been there. Now we are giving it words and, we, you know, it's grown, grown feet now so we can see the baby walking around and saying, okay, this is what it is. I really appreciate your honesty. I have one last question for you. You've got a lot of network of friends that are leaders and CEOs and whatnot. I'm sure this whole honesty, integrity, and unlimited sick vacation, and people just need a mental health day. Have they told you you're crazy for this? Um, absolutely. I think I'm crazy for this also. <laughs> but at some point of time, right, you have to draw a line. If you, if so, there are going to be, I mean, and, and again, we sit in our manager's meeting, very relevant. And I asked people, Bobby was there. I asked people, hey, should we take this away? Should we actually make it a 10-day sick policy a year? Like this is up for discussion. And every single one of them said no, because yes, while there will be a part of it, 10%, 20% of folks that will take advantage of it, but let them be the outliers. There is nothing you can do that will make it right for them. They'll always see the glass half empty, right? But the rest of them who appreciate it, who are more mature and, and, and who know this, are the ones that are going to appreciate it more. Like we do this on our own. Nobody asks us. I mean, our company's benefits, for example, keep getting better. Every time sometimes go by, like we keep on adding more stuff. So, you know, we, my friend calls it the golden handcuff, right? Like Google, where they give you all these benefits. It's like hard to leave at that point, right? That's what we are building. They're going to make it so difficult to leave by giving all these amazing things to folks that they're at some point of time, right? Yes, 20% of people will still take advantage. Like when Google gives you a USB phone chargers and all of that, I'm pretty sure there's somebody that goes and grabs a bunch of them, puts it in the bag and sells it on eBay, right? But there's like one or two people like that, not everybody. So, yeah. and, 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 they, and eventually it catches up to you, right? It always helps to do the right thing and then let things catch up to you. I love the fact about this because I talk to my clients about it all the time as an executive coach is how do you create such a culture or an, an environment that people don't want to leave from? By you offering these things, yes, there will be people that take advantage of it, but most people don't. And you take all the studies that have done with um, unlimited vacation, you have to remind most of them people to take vacation because they vacation. don't. It's unlimited. And you're like, that doesn't make sense because they become connected to their work and it really is something that you have to force them to do sometimes. Uh, you probably have to be forced to take vacations as well. 
<laughs> we have a mandatory vacation policy, so we don't do unlimited vacation. We do a vacation <laughs> policy that you have to use, right? Okay. I mean, if you don't use it, you're going to lose all of it. We don't cash it, nothing. So people say, well, let me use it. Otherwise, I'm going to lose it. I, I like that approach. I mean, I, I understand there's some situations where people can't travel and whatnot, but still, thank you so much, uh, Adoraid, for being here and, and sharing your concepts on culture with integrity and honesty. Thank you. Wow. What a great interview. I love his passion around this. Like I really felt like he believes all of this stuff. He's seen the impact across the organization. Integrity does matter. Building in a culture of integrity is something that you should be striving for. You want to make sure that you're doing this all the time, not just some of the time, all the time. Living integrity. You are a per person of your word. You encourage people to be a, a persons of their word. And you want to make sure that you are creating that honest feedback loops and giving the right structure to allow people to have that culture of integrity. That's my two cents. Love this interview. Hopefully you loved it too. When you think of growth and you think of leadership, think of Growth Think Tank. As always, the courage. We'll see you next time.